On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking alien autopsies, flat Earth, Planet X, and more on Our Favorite Space Conspiracies, Part 2. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 75, recorded on August 18th, 2023. Our Favorite Space Conspiracies, Part 2. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the open source password manager that can help you stay safe online. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise plan trial, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Our Favorite Space Conspiracies Part 2 edition. That's two for people who don't speak <laughs> duh. I'm Rod two, Pyle. This- Editor-in-chief of that Astro Magazine. I'm here with the inedible Tarek Malik, editor-in-chief of Space.com. How are you, my inedible friend? I'm doing well. I love sequels. I love being here for the sequel. So. This sequel is going to be the best thing since Star Trek II and Aliens. That, that's Oh, that's a high high praise. Well, uh, you know how we're going to get there is with space jokes. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Yes, let's do it. Uh, this is a new space dad joke from our friends at ChatGPT. I told my friend about the conspiracy theory that claims black holes are just cosmic vacuum cleaners. He said, that explains why my missing socks are in another galaxy. <laughs> Is that uh, the, the robot? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, a new sound effect. We have a budget. Okay. Okay, let me try another one. This is from an anon- a, a listener who wishes to remain anonymous for reasons that Tarek will still understand when his relatives disown him. <laughs> hey, Tarek. Yes, Rod. Why did NASA's top secret spring launched rocket never make it to space? Uh, why, why, Rod? I don't know. Because it went Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. Ooh. Ah, ah, ah. Hey, oh, hey, a lot better than the robot, uh, the chat GPT joke. Yeah. So clearly, well, clearly the, the AI has some, some high, high shoes, big shoes to fill. So. Yeah. And that was, that was 20 jokes in after I gave up on the first 19. So sad. Yeah. Well, as always, we invite you to join Tarek's Torture Squad and send us your best <laughs> or worst space joke. Don't forget to do us all a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all the other Groovy Podcast things. Now, yes, let's go to headlines. Do, 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 do. Did we ever get that that news ticker tape? No, sound? please do it for us. You know, breaking. Dun, 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 dun. Oh no, that's you know, that's sadly that's, that's Law and Order. <laughs> I'm actually old enough to remember teletypes. We had one at the first production company. I was the yeah. head of production there and we had a, I think they called it a telefax or something. And every now and then I'd be sitting in my office and I'd suddenly hear, ding, chunk, 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 chunk. It actually ran a mechanical bell and <laughs> typed out nice. a cable from overseas. Okay. Yes. You put in. I did. Moon I, I, photos from Russia and India, exclamation point. Tell yeah, us the I, news. I'm excited. So, you know, we've talked about the quote unquote race to the moon by, by Russia and India. India launched um, their Chandrayaan-3, uh, a lander, uh, several weeks ago. Russia launched Luna 25 last week. Uh, Russia's Luna 25, the first since 1976, entered orbit around the moon mm-hmm. since we last spoke. First first. Russian one, yeah. The first Russian one, yeah, since yeah. 1976, pardon me. And uh, and both uh, both missions, Chandrayaan-3 and uh, Luna 25, have now captured uh, their first really amazing images of the moon uh, from uh, from lunar orbit. So we were seeing um, a bunch of views of, of Earth from uh, the spacecraft, of the moon uh, from the spacecraft. And uh, if Everything goes well because so far it seems like both of these missions have gone swimmingly. Uh, if the, by the next time you and I talk, Rod, they're they may be on the uh, the south pole of the moon, and so I just wanted to kind of call that out. The, the photos of uh, uh, from uh, Luna twenty five, uh, the Russian ones show the the south polar crater Zeman, uh, which is on the far side of the moon, mm-hmm. and um, and then the the. Uh, uh, Chandrayaan photos, the Chandrayaan three photos, um, looks like they're they're showing just a bunch of different craters. A uh, geo geo uh, Giordano Giordano Giordano. Giordano. I, I, I apologize, I'm not very familiar with the name. Get Leo except, in here; he knows <laughs> how to do that. Giordano Bruno and Harkebi J. Um, uh, 
uh, craters that they can see uh, from the spacecraft too. So they're they're and they actually recorded a video too of, of passing over, which is pretty pretty cool uh, to see. And I hope that means that we might get live views of the landing from the spacecraft, which we did not have when uh, the last one, Chandrayaan two, tried to land with its rover. So uh, the dates for these are August twenty first. Uh, for Luna 25, so that's Monday as we're recording this, and uh, the 23rd, which I believe then is Wednesday, for um, uh, Chandrayaan 3, and it's, they do have windows, several days of windows for each of those landings, so one of them could get there first, the other one could uh, uh, could beat uh, uh, in, uh, uh, Russia to there, it just depends on how they're going to do these landings and see, and that's kind of the tenterhooks that I have for the moon. Uh, right now. I just wanted to share those photos because they're pretty, pretty awesome. Can I have an obnoxious boomer moment here? Oh, yes. Go ahead. What an achievement to get pictures of craters on the moon. Oh, wait, there's nothing but craters on the moon. Okay. (laughs) So the real question is, did they photograph any Apollo landing sites and not see the descent stage of the lunar module? Yeah. yeah. That's what we're talking about today. Or or did they see the monolith, right? On the the moon. That's right. (laughs) Be, or or uh, let's see, what was it? Hoagland, I think, wrote another book about pyramids and cities on the moon. Funny how hard they are to find. All right. <laughs> Next up, SpaceX delivers Starship mishap report to FAA. Finally, that's a little overdue. That's right. That's right. If uh, our listeners might recall, back on April 20th, uh, SpaceX launched their first ever Starship on, on an orbital test flight that did not reach orbit. Uh, it failed on the way up, exploded, a uh, big, big mess, uh, destroyed their launch pad. Elon Musk said, we're going to be back in space in two months. And two months came and went, and they had barely fixed the launch pad. So yeah. in the, in the the most recently, uh, SpaceX has uh, completed their their launch pad recovery. It seems like they they built a um, uh, a, a water deluge you know metal plate system right. uh, which they didn't have the first time. But they have to tell the FAA what happened in order to get a launch license for their next test flight. So what they've done is over the uh, weekend and, and payload and CNBC and a few others reported this, uh, and I, I actually was able to confirm it too at space.com uh, in our in our piece with uh, the FAA directly. Uh, SpaceX has delivered that misrep report where they can say exactly what happened, that you know they, they know what caused the failure, they know what caused all the damage. Uh, and uh, the big crucial thing is the FAA has to review this report and then accept the report. And then mm-hmm. based on that report, make recommended uh, uh, mitigations before they can then entertain any new launch license application for the next Starship. That sounds really, really complicated, but it means uh, the FAA wants SpaceX to say, hey, what happened? Own up to it. Find out what they can do to make the space flight safe again, or at least acceptable risk uh, for, for their launch, and then incorporate those changes into the next launch license before SpaceX can fly. It sounds like a lot to do, and so a September launch could be in, in question uh, to get all this done because, you know, it is the government. Uh, those reviews go, they don't go fast. And so, you know, that rosy two month deadline has come and gone. We'll see if they can get up there in another two months. So I think we should call the deluge system, the booster bidet. What do you think? <laughs> Looks about right. I've um, heard people call it that. I've heard people, hey. Scott Manley. Yeah. Scott Manley on, uh, uh, the, the space YouTuber called it that too. So, Oh dear. I probably just trampled the trademark. Well, and, and worth mentioning that, that waiting on all this is having a, a crude landing vehicle for Artemis three, which is rapidly approaching, at least in theory. And, uh, boy, they got a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is, that is something that, um, uh, we have to see how this is all going to shake out. Again, SpaceX says, oh, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. This is all part of development. But this first launch is not the only launch that they have to fly right. before they build a Starship to go to the moon. They have to launch uh, many of them again. And I think we've talked about this. Our, le- our, our, our listeners might remember uh, from April, they have to get into orbit. They have to get two of them into orbit at the first at the same time. They have to show that they can do refueling in orbit, which we've never really done at this scale before, uh, then yeah. they have to have a life support system. I mean, there's so many other things that have to go right. And this, this first step has taken forever. Well, Hey, that's a really nice chair. You're sitting in there that says star Trek on it. Kind of reminds me of the mothballed crew jacket I have sitting in my uh, closet. I think we <laughs> ought to place a bet. Oh no, no. So, First crude lunar landing for your Artemis program, 2027 or 28? 20, 20, 
27. So you've gone all the way beyond 2025. Like you just, you just oh, ex- assume they're not going to make it. <laughs> come so, on. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to bet the chair because, <laughs> because we know how that's going to Cause turn. you don't have any wheels to roll it to me. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But, but I think, I think, I think 2027 is a pretty good luck. Right. Um, I, I, I'm actually going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say the end of 2026 right now. You know, I hope they can make 2025, um, yeah. but I'll say the end of 2026. Okay. And I got another one. Yeah. Wait, what I, are you going to pick? You got to pick one if there's going to be a bet. Oh, uh, 28. Yeah. Okay. And I'll okay. bet you this here trim line phone <laughs> coming direct <laughs> to you from 1980. <laughs> um <laughs> So the other one would be Taiko Nuts on the Moon, 2020s or 2030s? Oh, 2030s. 2030s. Think so? I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I had always agreed with that, but in looking at some of their recent increasingly assertive announcements, I could see it happening in twenty late 2029, which is of course the anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Uh-huh. Uh that's with a, a lot point. of risk, and I'm not yeah. sure that they mind that. Well, you know, it could be that they've got stuff in in the works already, like yeah. that are that are fairly polished. What we've seen from all of their spaceflight missions, for the most part, uh, human and um, uh, and uncrewed, is that they 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 launch and they they tend to perform the far side moon landing. You know, for um, uh, Chengi, uh, was that three? Is that right or four? Uh, you know, is a, is a, a, a big example that the sample return yeah. mission, um, the fact that they, they flew a sample return mission r- dress rehearsal, uh, with the T five one, uh, before, uh, and then when they tried to do it, it went spectacularly, uh, I think show a track record that, you know, if they've, if they, say, if they say they can do it, they're probably going to do it. Uh, but you know, there's always these long gaps between the missions while they're preparing everything. So, all right, next and the final. New Horizons, which we talked about last week. That's right. Uses its instruments to study Neptune and, you know, the New Horizons <laughs> probe now well into the Kuiper Belt will turn its multispectral visible imaging camera back towards the outer two planets of the solar system to see the dark backsides of Neptune and, you know. Yeah, I'll let this you is that. The, the Uranus, Uranus. Whichever pronunciation you want, you want I don't Whichever know. Whichever one you want to look at the backside of, you, take it away. Why are you dancing around <laughs> it? Yeah, <laughs> because there's just no good way to say it. Well, well. So we actually got a sneak preview of this story last week, uh, last episode, when we were talking with, um, of course, Alan Stern, the the principal investigator behind the New Horizons mission. But uh, I, I picked up that cue, you know, and one of my uh, my colleagues uh, wrote the story for space.com about uh, about this project. And essentially the New Horizons team is preparing a series of measurements with uh, the multispectral visible imaging camera on uh, New Horizons uh, through September uh, to take images of the the far side, the back side of Neptune and Uranus to study those atmospheres like we've never been able to see them before because mm. we were always seeing the illuminated side when we're looking at the at the the planets uh, from from the Earth or or from Earth orbit with the Hubble and and whatnot. So the goal of the project is to get amateur astronomers and of course other astronomers around uh the planet with their actual uh professional telescopes to look at the front side the 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 illuminated side of both of those planets at the same time that the new horizons team is looking at the uh, the far side the 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 dark sides uh if you will uh which of course not not scientific because it does rotate like the earth does and uh, uh and and then compare how how they look to understand better how their atmospheres work in a day night cycle. I think it's a really interesting uh, project because anytime you have these simultaneous observations, it gives you a, a, a more complete picture of how any planet works, let alone these giants in the outer solar system that we have, you know, we've, we know a lot about them, but still they, they, we haven't sent orbiters to these, uh, these planets to get closer looks of them all. So any, anything new that we can learn about them, I think will be exciting. And we just found out uh, this week that the clouds of Neptune are disappearing for some reason. Yeah. And maybe uh, th- that's from the Hubble Space Telescope's observations. And maybe um, this kind of project to look at the far side, maybe that's where they're going, right? They're, they're going to the, the dark yeah. side and they're, they're rebuilding. Who knows? It's chemtrails. You know it is. 
<laughs> Always bringing it back to the subject of our episode, right? I know. Very, what a shame. <laughs> All right. Well, let me just remind everybody, if you believe in science and want New Horizons to continue this kind of good work, please steer your browser to go.nss.org forward slash new dash horizons. That's go.nss.org forward slash new horizons, new, new dash horizons, and uh, be heard on our petition that, that the NSS and a number of other post-case groups have put together. Uh, it's going a little slow, and we want NASA to get the memo along with Congress. So um, please go go sign that. And you know, admittedly, and we didn't really touch on this too much last week, but you know, when there are budget cuts at NASA, they have to be spread around, and, and we get that. But when you're talking a couple million bucks, which is what we're talking here, whether it's NASA budgets or modern video game or movie budgets, that ain't a lot of money. So uh, I think this is one worth protecting. And, uh, you know, Boeing can afford a couple of less lunches on, on the government tab. And, uh, and as Alan mentioned, uh, Alan Stern mentioned uh, yeah. in our last episode, the, the, the science that's being cut can be done at the same time as the science NASA says that they want. Uh, so, um, so, you know, do check that out. You know, they, they could use all the support that uh, they can get. Absolutely. And we will be forever grateful. All right. We're going to be right back with our favorite space conspiracies part two after this short break. Stay with us. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden, the only open source cross-platform password manager anywhere, anytime. Security Now's Steve Gibson has even switched over. With Bitwarden, all of the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. In the summer of 2023, G2 Enterprise Grid Report, they solidified their position as the highest performing password manager for the enterprise, leaving competitors in the dust. Bitwarden protects your data and privacy by adding strong randomly generated passwords for each account. And you can go further with the username generator, creating unique usernames for each account or use any of the five integrated email alias services. You can transparently view all of Bitwarden's code too. It's available on GitHub. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed yearly, and that's important. And those results get published on their website. Bitwarden is open source security you can trust. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is $3 per month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 per month per user. And individuals always get Bitwarden's basic free account for unlimited passwords. You can upgrade at any time to a premium account for less than $1 per month, or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Bitwarden has also launched this new Bitwarden Secrets Manager, which is soon coming out of beta. Secrets Manager keeps those sensitive developer secrets out of source code and eliminates the risk of public exposure. To test out the new Secrets Manager, visit bitwarden.com slash secrets beta. At Twit, we're fans of password managers. Get started with Bitwarden's free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we're back. Hey. All right. I'm going to kick off with a, if you don't mind, yes, Alec, yes. a, a, a re, reread, a recap of a definition of conspiracy from the American Psychological Association, because who would know better? <laughs> Quote, a conspiracy theory can normally be defined as a proposed plot carried out in secret, usually by a powerful group of people who have some kind of sinister goal. Sinister. That would be me. <laughs> uh, so something to gain from what they're doing and usually don't have people's best interests at heart. Usually their own interests are at heart. Um, and they went on to talk about concerns that conspiracy theories are on the rise due to easy access to social media and self-reinforcing algorithms, which I think most listeners to the show certainly understand. We do get on social media and say, I don't believe they landed on the moon. You're going to see lots of material about that. <laughs> and that's a shame. Um, on the other hand, Conspiracies tend to indicate a desire for more information and truth, which is certainly a laudable goal. They do tend to happen during times of uh, uncertainty. Um, no, no judgment here, but they do tend to be predominated by people of uh, less education, which is not a value judgment. It's just something that appears to be the case in the graph. 
They have an increased drought of conspiracy theories, possibly due to less training and critical thinking, although I'm not sure how much that goes on in, in uh, American education today anyway. <laughs> desire for safety and certainty, a desire to feel good about themselves, the groups they are part of. Desire to know something special, secrets, hidden information, and have a sense of uniqueness and superiority. Now, that's not always the case. There are plenty of people that believe some of the stuff we're going to talk about that are very well centered psychologically, certainly, and uh, who have done some research. But by and large, the bulk of this seems to to come from those areas. Um, and I just want to, if you'll if you'll give me a moment here, I want to mention an experience I had last week. Uh, I get pings from Quora every now and then to answer questions. A Quora is an it's really interesting site if you've never been on there. <laughs> One guy asked a question that I that I was, I was pinged with today. Have people ever landed on the moon? And it's like, dude, if <laughs> no, you can get no, on the internet not, not at all. <laughs> to ask this, how can you not stumble over this thing called Wikipedia that talks all about it? Um, but there was another question. Uh, let me see if I can remember what it was. Oh, um, Buzz Aldrin has been quoted as saying that we never landed on the moon. Uh, so how can we believe anything or something I'm paraphrasing, but something like that. So I wrote in the first answer, which is basically, you know, look, uh, he never said that he's been misquoted on television before on ancient aliens, at least once where they did a critical edit and when they asked him, have you ever seen a UFO? And he said, yeah, I've seen UFOs. That just means they're unidentified and you know where they did the edit. <laughs> so anyway, I answered that question, and much to my glee, it was followed up by about 240 comments saying, who is this troll, and how can anybody, and what's wrong with you, and you, you need to you're, have... You're the troll, or the... No, the, the other guy. Okay, okay. He, he needed remedial diaper training and all kinds of other things. It got uh, 80,000 views and I think 2,000 upvotes in a week, which isn't that much, but for me, that's a lot. Yeah. So that was uh, that was good to see, because people but, actually were paying attention. So you're fighting the good fight against uh, well, the, the yeah and there's this you know in both your area and mine there's this kind of constant tension between do you engage deniers and conspiracists or do you simply ignore them and my concern is that without engagement it just grows like a fungus I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you another like a story very similar to that is there was a time in the uh, early 2000s where everyone and their mother were finding things on Mars because yes. we had the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter finally, you know, doing really high res stuff. And they were finding, you know, this hidden alien base. And I know we're going to talk about some stuff on Mars in a bit. And space.com wrote a story about it, like a, like a debunking story saying, no, it's, you know, this is not an alien, you know, hidden base that, that the Zetans or whoever are, are operating out of. Zeta reticuli. I, I put it, I put it on the, on the, on the, you know, the, in the, the top spot on space.com and, and just got a comment that when we do that, we legitimize everything. And so don't put them in the top spot anymore. And I was like, all right, fast forward 15 years. And NASA is talking about UFOs on Cong and Congress is talking about UFOs. And it's like, you just can't, you can't get away from it anymore. So, yeah. I don't know well, what the point of that story was. I'm sorry, Rod. <laughs> so somebody who who should know better asked me the other day about the uh, recent report, you know, the whistleblower report that we talked about. Is it Gersh? Is that his name? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, military guy who, who came and sat down and testified to Congress. And, you know, I, I said, look, really read the report and you're going to see that it's mostly I heard and someone said and a friend of a friend of mine and all that which doesn't automatically disqualify it. It just weakens the impact a bit. And as we often quote Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Where's the beef? And I read a piece of the, a piece the other day by famed science fiction author, David Brin, who's never shy about expressing his opinions saying as, as others have said, you know, we've got, I don't know, a, half a billion or more really high quality cameras and audio recording devices all over the planet. And yet the imagery from the sightings has gotten no better. There's still little <laughs> f fuzzy dots and things, you know, jumping around in the frame. And uh, that, of course, excludes the military stuff. But even that, you know, the the imagery that came back from the, um, the jets off the Nimitz a few years back, you know, it's low res, it's flurry imaging. I think it's flurry, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the Navy, the, the Navy uh, the jet jet pilot recordings yeah yeah laser radar oh and, you know that's the aliens have technology that makes it look like that 
right? Like you could, you could take it like a picture of ET and he would hold up his glowing really? finger and it would, uh, it would, uh, Gee, here I always thought camera. it was just the technology. But, <laughs> you know, it's just because they don't have enough separate data points or sources, you know, if it's either just the jet or just the ship or just the single radar, if you can't triangulate between things, it just makes makes it hard to take it seriously. So yeah. I don't pick, know, take pick, it for what it's worth. Pick, real pics or it didn't happen, you know? Show me yeah. the spaceship. Show me the actual spaceship. Show we me Tark falling out of his chair. <laughs> so, um, that happened like... Okay, two times. So two times. And was it two or three? Well, sir, uh, it happened. At, <laughs> it happened at least twice on camera. That's all. We're saying. Oh yeah, that doesn't include the That's coffee right. spills. Oh, no, you're you're right. Yeah, you're we're right. not going to talk about how many times it happened off camera. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the bumps and bruises to show it. All right, uh, Doctor Malik, please uh, pick pick your favorite conspiracy. Let's, well, let's I, jump in. Uh, I, I was really excited to see that the Mars life meteorite was on our list of, of conspiracies. And this, you know, as we've talked a little bit about the ALH meteorite from uh, uh, the nineties where, you know, there was a, we thought it was life, but it was not, not really a conspiracy, just like a mistake, you know, right. uh, that got well, a, a mistake as announced by the white house, exactly, Clinton, exactly. which was a big I mean, moment. Yeah. And, um, but, but in 2011, March of 2011, uh, there was this big brouhaha on the internet from uh, uh, the Journal of, of Cosmology that claimed that another meteorite, and I believe this one was in, um, I think it was in Europe, uh, but, the, but that they had actual proof of, of like fossils, like uh, of life in this, this meteorite. And I remember it happened like over a weekend because I was on the phone with my, my writer and colleague, Clara Moskowitz, about what to do about it. And I, I just, I thought it was just bonkers and crazy. And we were going to just look more into it. So we didn't write about it right away until uh, it was clear that it wasn't, um, it wasn't fully vetted. Like the science wasn't there. It was a meteorite that had been, you know, touched many times on the ground. Uh, it wasn't very, you know, sterile. Like it, there was a lot of questions about it. Um, and the, the, the folks at this, this journal, and it was a, like a self-published journal, if memory, um, mm. if memory serves, uh, you know, they, 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 they just, the science never really held up and they were referred, like it was criticized as being garbage at that point in time. But the, the part that really made this um, uh, this kind of conspiracy theory stand out to me is how vociferous the backers of the journal were at the time. They were sending out uh, press releases claiming that uh, their initial press release, which a lot of people wrote about and quoted from, was being plagiarized because people were quoting from it, which is what you do. Yeah. In a press release. <laughs> right. That's the whole and, point. Right. And, and, um, and I, I got, I mean, when I, and I actually had to interact with them a couple of times because they were actually like claiming that we were in on it. Space.com was in on it and they, they were naming us as never people cover up. that they were going to sue because we were hiding it all and that we were, we were, uh, coming out and, and it was just a really strange uh, time. But the, um, uh, the 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 nut of it is that just the 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 the, the evidence for the, the organisms really wasn't um, uh, strong enough uh, because there could have been contamination from people handling it over over the years uh, on Earth. It's been on Earth for you know since for billions of years since it, since it was recovered, you know, and um, and so it just it didn't really um, it didn't really convince any scientist that it was really uh, really. Uh, Germain. We actually talked to Seth Shostak at that time, and he said, you know, that that the 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 the, the photos they were, you know, pretty you know, suggestive, but they looked like photos made out of various terrestrial bacteria, not ones from uh, from space. You know, it was hardly proof, is what he told us at the time. Uh, but this doesn't, you know, it doesn't doesn't go away. This the, those those claims just persisted over time, and they come back from. Uh, from time to time about this, this hidden proof of life in these, these meteorites that uh, NASA just keeps uh, keeping under wraps. And the same journal uh, and the, some of the same folks behind that have come back and said that uh, images on Mars are hiding stuff and that NASA is keeping it from us too. And you just have to take it all with a grain that of salt. That boosts credibility. Well, yeah. so this meteorite was found in Antarctica, correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. And, and the images were really compelling because it looked like little light gray worms draped over rock structure. But as I recall, 
uh, any any issues of terrestrial contamination aside, they were way off in scale and they were fossilized. So these weren't these weren't soft organisms that you picked up on Earth. They were something yeah. that was embedded in the crust and it was it was a hard mineral material. But that there were plenty of non organic explanations about how they could have gotten there and formed. It was just those pictures were so compelling, right? Because yeah. they look like worms. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's they, more exciting than space worms? It's, it's, a, it's well, when you put it like that, right? They put things in our bodies, <laughs> Captain. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, you know, instead of defending the science, the, the, at the time, the journal was claiming that, that they, it wasn't, it wasn't getting mainstream coverage because, mm. you know, it wasn't, it was, it was science that the, like the, the, the journal science, the journal nature, you know, didn't want to support that they were trying to make money and squash the, the open free dissemination of these things. And that's why it was going on. So it was just a really uh, strange thing. And every now and then, if you ever see, um, you know, claims that come up from meteorites, if it's not the ALH one, which, you know, again, we've talked about, that was like a, a big snafu and NASA did eventually own up to it. And you see them being really, really cautious. They were for this one too. They weren't really commenting uh, too much because they were trying to understand what was going on. Right. Um, but for me, it was really, really surreal because there were a lot of just like claims that space.com was doing things that I personally was doing things uh, to, to keep everyone down. And I love a good conspiracy theory. I tell you, you know, you know, my feelings about Michael Jackson, I'm still not convinced, but, but, uh, <laughs> and Elvis, uh, yeah. <laughs> Elvis on the moon, right? So, <laughs> All right. Mr. Editorial. Yeah. Well, so, and it's a fascinating story. And, you know, I, of course, I think like a lot of us, secretly wish that someday they'd say no we it was true you know yeah. we really did find critters there but it just yeah. hasn't happened yet and as much as we'd like it to that's where it is now okay we're going to be back to talk about flat earth so of course you want to stick around right after this break stay with us all right the earth is flat i'm surprised we didn't start with this one in part one you know in the first time <laughs> well because like, it's we, it's so we, big and brazen we, so we stopped, we stopped talking. We, we ended that first episode. And like, literally the first thing is I said, we, <laughs> we didn't even talk about flat earth. I all. know so. <laughs> because it, it, and it's so, it's shockingly pervasive. So to the point that modern people are still saying, well, we have no proof, even though we've gone to the moon and look, well, some say we've gone to the moon and look back and seen the earth as a little ball. So in 2017 rapper, Bobby Ray Simmons, starts crowdfunding a campaign to raise a million dollars to launch a satellite to prove that the earth is flat. Uh, he got a lot of PR out of it. Didn't get the numbers, I guess. Um, but the numbers of flat earth believers have gone up ever since. And they even yeah. have their own yearly conference, which I think, you know, if you weren't, a, if you weren't suppressing the truth, Tarek, you'd go to that conference. That's, that's you'd right. Give us a report. So my my best friend said, can I go cover that conference for space.com? And I'm like, no, no, man. No. Well, and, and, you know, let's just look at, at the big sweep of it. So the Greeks, you know, those guys way back there, the ones that wore togas and, and wandered around uh, stony temples and things, figured, okay, we think the earth is round. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of them postulated that. But the first test was done by, what was the guy's name? Er er Erasthenes and Erasthenes. Erasthenes, yes. 240 yeah. BCE. Uh put a stick in the ground during the summer solstice in the city of Alexandria and uh, saw a seven degree shadow offset. So as I understand the story, let me make sure I get this right. Uh, yeah, no vertical shadows. So the sun was when the sun was directly overhead. So yeah. I wondered if this is also true in Syene. I think that's how it's pronounced. So he hired a guy there was a, a, a league of people that would, would measure things with their feet. So they'd count their steps going somewhere and then convert that into stadia, which was their, their linear measure uh, unit. Um, had somebody pace off the distance of that city and put a stick on the ground to summer stolces there and notice uh, sorry, there was a seven degree offset there and not in Alexandria, if, I, if I'm getting this right. Um, so if, if the sun's overhead and the earth is flat, you wouldn't have expected to see that offset. Mm -hmm. And through that, using math that thousands of years later, I still can't fully grasp. <laughs> he figured out between that, that offset of the shadow and the distance between the two cities, 
he figured out the circumference of the earth, which is pretty amazing. It's, and by it's golly, crazy, it's crazy stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's proved to be the same ever since. Yeah. It's one thing to learn this stuff in college. It's another to be the first and that first thought it up. So, you know, we've kind of had a hunch and this, you know, this is long after people said, gee, that ship sailing out to sea just disappeared over the horizon. Where did it go? Well, it either sank or it went over a curved surface and, and disappeared from your, your straight line of sight. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and yet again, so uh, in the 1800s, there was a pushback on, on this science. A British writer named Samuel Robotham, which is almost as weird a name as Pyle, <laughs> um, in the mid to late 1880s, proposed that the Earth is a flat, immovable disk. This is refining it a bit, centered at the North Pole, with Antarctica being an ice wall at the disk's outer boundary, because, of course, you have to keep the oceans from falling off, Right. And uh, sadly, I have to confess that most flat earth believers live in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> and boy, there's a whole bunch of commentary that can go around that. Um, so the sun and the moon are each about 36 miles in diameter and orbit the disk with the stars on a rotating dome. It just gets better and better. Uh, no idea where the gravity comes from, of course. Um, Isn't it just like turtles all the way down? To, well, that's uh, the, the older system. Yeah, it, now. It, it's four elephants and then like on top of a giant turtle. Well, now it's orcs. It's orcs. <laughs> we like orcs. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you get into things. If you've ever seen a Foucault pendulum, which we used to have up at Griffith Observatory when I worked there, which is a big, long pendulum that swings back and forth and changes over time because the earth is rotating underneath it. Is it not there anymore? No, it's still there. It's oh, just great. the, the, we used to have to jump down the pit to set up little pegs that proved that it was actually moving over time. And now it's been automated because somebody hurt themselves jumping in and it's the city of Los Angeles and all that. But you know, you got that, you got the Coriolis force where water going down a drain turns one direction in the Northern hemisphere and another in the lower hemisphere. Anyone who's ever been to sea, as you watch the port that you departed from sink below the horizon, you think, well, that's curious. Either America's going underwater or um, the earth must be curved. So you know, how, what do we do with that? And in fact, there was that guy recently that uh, built his own rocket. He built his own rocket. Like nobody had done that before mm -hmm. to go up and see for himself that the earth is curved and he died, right? He did. He was, yeah. a, he was a daredevil. And uh, I wish he was we a had nut. His, I'm sorry. He was I wish nut. we had his name. Uh, I, it's, I'm, I personally am not convinced that he actually believed that the earth was flat. I believe mm -hmm. that it was a part of the, 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 the marketing for that that stunt uh to do it and um but it is it is sad that he did lose his life in that accident even though people did tell him his rocket was not really safe uh for it um but you know i i just i wonder if it's just the enormity of the planet you know uh that that really gets this that, that kind of helps this whole idea persist because we what we see versus what science tells us the world is can appear to be very different things because of how small we are on this planet, right? And uh, and so you know we we don't see all of this round stuff. Even when you get on get on a plane and get up really high, you can see the horizon and you can watch the country roll by. You know, right? Uh, I, we cross the country, you know, back and forth between our uh, my, my 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 family lives in California, and uh, and you you see it all underneath you and. To, 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 to think that that's all one giant globe is is crazy, but uh, but that's what it is, right? That's what the science shows that it is. That's what NASA and astronauts many times over have told me that they you know that they that they see, and I, I have no reason to doubt them because where does the water go at the end? Is it just does it well, fall think, off, or I does think it Ant go? Has under? a knowing comment. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sitting here looking at the website and I've already given up faith on these people. And, and <laughs> I mean, the website is hilarious. And then why, I think we may have won this battle gents because there's not been anything reported since 2016. So oh, ooh, there you go. So have we gotcha. worn them out and, and, and gotten them to get over themselves or, or what? Well, or they're just like me and they don't update very often. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, I think part of the attraction of this is that it's a very primal in your face kind of thing. You know, you can deny the moon landings or, you know, you can talk about life on meteors being covered up. But when you when you join the group that says the Earth is flat, you're really making a statement. Now, to some of us, that statement would be, hi, I'm Rod and I'm ignorant. 
But to other people, it would be in your face, in your face, the earth is flat. It's all a big lie. I don't understand the attraction, but obviously somebody does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can say, though, while I don't believe that the earth is flat, I am a very big fan of a flat planet called Discworld in a book written by <laughs> Terry Pratchett. And that place is amazing. So if people just want their world mm. to be like Discworld, then I get that. However, you know, we do live in reality and, uh, and we live on a planet, one planet of many in a, in a solar system of many in a galaxy of many. So if it, you know, I, I can understand the draw to try to explain at least one part of all of that enormity. Uh, because if you just like sit there and think about it, for more than the second, man, it's a lot, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's a lot, the universe. So, whew. boy, imagine if all the planets, all the exoplanets around all the other stars were flat. Yeah. You wouldn't I, be able to see them if they were on edge, right? I, re I read a book. I read a science huh? book. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. We wouldn't see anything. Just a bunch of Frisbee disc lines right. in space. So. Well, now, so now somebody is going to write in saying, here's a picture from, from the web and look at all those little edge on things. Those are flat planets. And we'll have to say, no, those are galaxies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So, um, it's, it's just, it's very reminiscent of the epicycles. Remember the epicycles? Rod? Yes. Uh, uh, well, for when, the epicycles were clever. Yeah. They were, you were trying to explain away things that you were seeing by coming up with more and more complicated movements of the planets and well their and that was and to keep the earth at the center of the solar it, system it was to right? keep the, the the earth at the center of everything you know uh and later the sun at the center of everything from what right. we we're seeing and and just there there comes a time where it just must be too exhausting to try to keep <laughs> believing in something that very clearly is not true and just say you know what yeah okay yeah the earth is round I'll go find another thing, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, Sasquatch. Epicycle, so, so epicycles were orbits around the big orbit. Yes. So yeah. they were going in little circles. So little like the, yeah. the, the, the moon would have its own little, little mini orbit in its bigger orbit. Right. It would do this one and this thing. And then they, they, they might have other little epicycles of their own go all the way down to try to explain the movements of these, these, these objects. So, and, and you got to admire, and I don't remember who, you know, I, I always look at this train of Greek names and try to memorize them. I don't remember who came up with that epicycles, but when you think about what it took to come up with that idea and make it work in your head and a piece of papyrus or stone tablet or whatever they wrote on with a piece okay. of charcoal, and, and that's we pretty impressive. We shouldn't say that it's, that it's, that, that's not a conspiracy. That was a science evolving over time, trying to understand you know, the, where everything is and, and how it all works. Well, that's what uh, you say. You know, well, we know that <laughs> aliens told them that. So that's right. Let's get down to business here. All, all right. Uh, we're going to be back with more conspiracy goodness right after this short break. Don't go anywhere. All right. So I got a good one for you. All right. I'm ready for it. Planet X. Oh, Planet X. So Planet X slash Planet Nine slash Nibiru. Nibiru. Pick, your, pick your name, pick your conspiracy. Um, there's an extra planet out there that we can't see. And the ideas behind this have ranged from it's on the other side of the sun. So it's hiding from us, which mm -hmm. was disproved by a couple of solar probes that went in orbit around the sun and could see the other side of the sun, but that's okay. Um, and has evolved now to it's way out there in the big, bad dark and it's a rogue planet and it's got earth's number and they're coming to get us and all that kind of stuff. Now that's the, the bonkers side, the more legitimate side, which is probably part of what feeds this, is that uh, back around, I think, 2015, when I was working at Caltech, Mike Brown and Constantin Batigan, who were two astronomers slash astrophysicists there, said, you know, we're looking at the courses of some of these bigger objects in the Kuiper belt, and the math seems to indicate there could be something, some large gravitational force mm -hmm. out there. And of course, Mike Brown being Mike Brown called it planet nine because oh, yeah. he doesn't think Pluto is a planet. Don't tell Alan Stern. <laughs> I know. And then later it was referred to as planet X, which I found delightfully ironic because of course X means 10. Mm -hmm. So planet 10, nanner, 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 Pluto well, is planet, a planet. We should point that planet X has been around for like a long time. You know, in yeah. science fiction, they would always say, oh, planet X, the journey to planet X. And, right. and even when, 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 you know, in the nineties, when I was coming up, there was always the idea that there might be a 10th planet out there. Cause Pluto, of course, was still a full fledged planet, not a right. dwarf planet uh, as it is now. Um, but this was like, a whole, this is like a whole different ball of wax. 
that we're talking about here. So let's stay on the on the on the the wacko side. So yeah, okay, um, this was this kind of came barreling back in uh, years before 2012, which That's was right. of course when the Mayan calendar supposedly predicted that Earth was going to come to an end, and somehow spoiler, that was, spoiler alert, uh, it yeah. didn't. So <laughs> that was related to Nibiru, which would be what would come and destroy Earth. Um, and so on and so on. And other people cited Sumerian texts and, of course, psychics channeling aliens that told us that Nibiru was supposed to orbit the sun every 36,000 years, and uh, which is way faster than Planet X would be if it exists. And uh, so on and so forth. And, you know, despite the fact that having another Earth-sized planet on the far side of the sun would really mess up calculations of the orbits of the planets as we know them, this does persist. And I, I, I don't know if it has its own website or not. I suppose was, it probably does. Was it that Nibiru would line up and cause like a big planet alignment that was going to mess everything up? Like the balance of the solar system and gravity? Yeah, because Jupiter this? going past us every number of decades wouldn't do that, right? It, it was like something like that. Yeah. What was funny is that Nibiru found its way into Star Trek because because I think it was in Star Trek, the, the, the second reboot, was it uh, Into Darkness? They, oh. they go to the planet Nibiru, you know, and it's not in our solar system, you know, and uh, of course it does have its own disaster. So maybe that's a bad example. But, but anyway. Is that the one with um, the guy who played Sherlock Holmes? Who's yes, Louis Benedict King? Cumberbatch. Boy, that movie, sorry to go on a little rant here, but that <laughs> movie, uh, you know, having worked in, in a few story rooms here and there briefly uh, in Hollywood, that movie was like taking VHS copies of every Star Trek ever and snipping them the little bits and tossing them in a bin and shaking it around and then <laughs> taping them back together and saying, here's our plot, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. Maybe that's part of the conspiracy to keep us all distracted from the real stuff, the real stuff that's out there. Well, that's a good one. So how do we push back on not Planet X? Cause that's just, you know, searching the Kuiper belt until you find something big and dark and hairy. But uh, Nibiru part of part of part of it, I think, has to be with education and whatnot about what what these things actually are. Oh, you're I found very latest. Well, no, what I found what I found really interesting about Nibiru in particular in 2012 is that it got to the point that um, a NASA scientist at J JPL and I, I cannot recall the scientist's name now, but I, I heard a very heartfelt um, uh, interview with him on NPR later. Uh, because he had recorded a video to tell everyone that like it was going to be fine, that that, <laughs> that Nibiru as a disastrous planet uh, wasn't real, that uh, 2012 as like the end of the, the Mayan calendar wasn't going to destroy Earth. And he did it because, as he said in the NPR interview, um, that he was getting emails and letters, like actual letters, not from, you know, crackpot people. Or or conspiracy theorist people. Like you're you know, so no offense to anybody, but he was getting he was getting letters from like kids who didn't mm -hmm. know like what to do. Like they they're seeing all of these memes, all of this social media stuff, uh, everything about how 202012 was the end of everything, and what uh, what hope was there for them, which is really really sad. Yeah, you know when a, uh, when these these conspiracy things like this get to that level. My daughter, you know, she's she's going into high school now. But I, we had our own little moment where I was trying to explain what would happen when the sun died, you know, in five billion years or whatever it's going to be and how it's going to puff up into a red giant. And she's looking around and this is when she was like four or five years old. And she's like, what's going to happen to her toys and what's going to happen to like Aww. our room? You know, and it's it's that kind of they're going to melt just right? like you, sweetheart. And, and that was just not even an actual conspiracy. Right. That yeah. was just me not realizing that it's probably too young <laughs> to put existential dread into a child <laughs> about the end of the solar system. And so the fact that that, you know, in 20, 2012 and, and, you know, that that's all anyone could see wherever mm. they turned leading up to the end of the year. Um, was just was just really sad and I, so letting people know to like check their sources and vet you know is 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 like the best thing that we can do it also helps if they ever do finally find whatever this planet thing is because i find it very weird that they keep they keep seeing traces of it but they can't find it out there and we've got the kuiper James, belt is far away we have this james webb space telescope the most powerful thing ever and i think it's going to be a matter of time before they start pointing that 
at um you know patches of the corp about to go find those things um but that could certainly help uh, over time too they just you know it's everything out there i think the challenge has been that it's all dark you know it doesn't yeah. reflect a lot of light so it's very difficult to find it and they have to wait and, and see if they can they can catch anything out there maybe we need more kuiper belt pl- uh, probes uh or maybe we need an episode on how to pronounce kuiper belt kuiper kuiper i don't know I, I've both. Uh, I, you know we'll all end up pronouncing it however uh, amazon decides to pronounce it with their their kuiper belt internet <laughs> constellation so i'm gonna take a brief diversion here because i want to read some other lovely <laughs> questions from so, cora yeah which it's fun if you've never been on there. Of course, 90% of it is people asking about World War II. You know, were German Tiger tanks really better than Sherman's? And it's like, I don't know how that kind of evolved, but there's plenty of space stuff. Um, let's see. Did landing on the moon really do anything? Uh, it's not even really a question, so there are no answers yet. Uh, I like this one. Why is the United Kingdom still not landed on the moon? Answer? There's no point in it. There are no decent pubs or fish and chip shops. <laughs> Wait, these aren't conspiracies. <laughs> oh, here we go. I don't believe that Americans walked on the moon. Must I be despised for denying that fact? And oh. that's an interesting one. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's, it's kind of plaintive. And <laughs> the answer was despised? No. Held in contempt and ridiculed as an idiot? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, man, that's harsh. That's um, harsh. Let's see. What was the new second really? If the moon landing was not staged, how does the moon landing, uh, just repeat yourself, explain why the lunar module in which the astronaut supposedly went to the moon has such a ridiculous design? It looks <laughs> like it's made of cardboard. How could they get there like that? Answer, you know, if you just asked why the lunar module looks the way it does, then we could all admire you for your curiosity and desire to learn. Instead, you ask the question in such a way that leads us to ridicule you for being an idiot. Yeah, the lunar module, the world's first actual true spaceship. The one, the one that was designed to never, ever fly through the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, and, and, and yes, it's delicate and weird looking, yeah. and that even caused some consternation with the Grumman engineers who were designing the thing. But if you study it, which I have to absurd lengths because I wrote a book chapter about it, it, it all makes plenty of sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, they even took out the seats for weight because why do you need seats if you're going to be landing and on And many the, of the windows, yeah. that's right. Um would Neil Armstrong have been burned alive if he had landed on the moon in daylight? And the answer was asterisk, 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 idiot. <laughs> but finally, my favorite, do you think we faked the moon missions? Answer, oh, we tried, but Hollywood said they didn't have the equipment and Neil Armstrong was a terrible actor, so we just had to go instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. All right. Let's, yes. Yes. Let's hear it for Neil Armstrong and his, yeah, he wouldn't have been much of an actor. Um, okay, this is a good one. Yeah. I mean, they're all good, but. I, some, it, some of these on this list, I've never heard before, you know. Well, you've so, heard of Alien Autopsy. I've heard of that one, yes. So. so, for those who don't know the backstory, this started with a 17-minute film released in 1995 by a guy, I think he was in England, named Ray Santilli. It was on Fox News. I remember this. Well, later. It was yeah. supposed to document a 1940s Roswell, New Mexico autopsy of dead aliens supplied on the, the lowdown by the cameraman that shot it. Later, in 2005, Santilli admitted it was a recreation, quote unquote, based on other footage he viewed in 1992. And in 95, Fox released the absurd show narrated by my pal Jonathan Frakes. Shame on you. <laughs> and it was a rating <laughs> sensation. Huge, huge. Uh, you can't get those kind of numbers from a real documentary. Even when the director later said he thought it was a fraud. Interviewees included Stan Winston, who's probably the king of makeup effects in Hollywood. Creature, creature effects, yeah. Yeah. Kevin Randall, a UFO investigator who was highly regarded, who both claimed they had been misrepresented, which in uh, having sat next to an alien autopsy or a uh, ancient aliens editing room back in the day, they've gotten much better but back in the day. I, I saw some of that editing uh, at work. And of course the producers are like, Oh, 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 cut it there. That's perfect. <laughs> some still claim their original frames from that film. And in fact, one was supposedly auctioned a couple of years ago for a lot of money left from the supposedly 22 reels of supposedly original film. 
Uh, in Alien Autopsy, however, the bodies were depicted using latex casting containing sheep brains set in raspberry jam, chicken yes. entrails, and knuckle joints. Ugh, knuckle joints. Yeah. <laughs> and boy, that was a fun afternoon after a couple of hours. Um, I had to do an educational film on breathing with sheep lungs once that we were inflating using a tube. And being the director, I was nominated to do the inflating. Look, and unfortunately, so they we, we, we've got the video of it. Look at this. <laughs> unfortunately, that lung had sat for a couple of days and I blew into it. And then when the lung deflated, it blew a bunch of rotting lung stuff in my mouth. Oh, that was so a bad gross. day. That's anyway, that's an aside. So alien autopsy. We just saw like some clips of it and it just does not look at all real. You know, and I remember when it was on Fox and like how, how awful it looked. And yet, man, we all had to like just watch anyway because it's on TV. So yeah, it's like train wreck watching. Yeah. And, you know, and it was compelling. I mean, here's a big network with a major TV star claiming carefully and, and somewhat indirectly that, that this was a real thing. So, of course, you know, if if you're of a certain state of mind, you're going to go, well, you know. It's coming from a credible source, kind of. Um, and this is a long time ago, so one might have thought it was more credible than it was because the internet isn't what it is now. Yeah. And, um, you know, you it created a sensation. Then? So. Yes, Aunt? Is that certain state of mind you mentioned, is that drunk or is that high? <laughs> Gullible? Guileless? Um, pick, pick your adjective. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I assumed instantly, but I'm a cynic. I assumed instantly that it was a fake. Um, the funny thing is, you know, I think even amongst the doubters of us, we kind of like that to be true. You we know, well, here's, here's it's the a thing. very attractive we, hypothesis. We were just talking like 10 minutes ago about how big the universe is compared to like us on this yeah. planet. And, you know, we have found through all of these different space missions and space telescopes, many, many planets, you know, NASA has thousands that they've found many of them with conditions that seem like it could be like this. It's just, it's in, in unfathomable that we are like the only place in the entirety of all existence for the last 15 billion years that we know of, right? Cause there could be other universes too. Uh, where there, where there, where there are people, let alone creatures and life and all the fun, you know. Well, dads, excuse me, you say like. that, but when we have Pascal Lee back on a couple of weeks, if you want to lose the first half hour of the episode, ask him about his n equals one hypothesis from the Drake <laughs> equation, and he will give you a rather detailed and deeply thought out examination and conclusion of why we're it. Well, I mean, a lot I, of that's I can, the time I, offset. I, 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 I find it. I, it would be sad if we were the only example of sentient life in the, in the, in the universe. If this is the best and, the universe can do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but so I understand the draw to want to believe because I, 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 I think that there's probably life out there somewhere. Have we seen it? No. Have I seen the evidence that they're beaming up cows and uh, all that fun stuff? Probably not. How many cows um, do you have to look at? Well, I don't, maybe they're not like some sort of like really aggressive vegetarians that just want to take all the cows so that everyone oh, else they want to, to study how to grow extra stomachs no, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that or I make humans at a cud maybe <laughs> can i can i ask about one of the really weird ones here because i've yeah, never yeah, heard yeah. it before the iss yes is underwater so all that footage from space is those astronauts without any breathing gear, mind you, swimming in an underwater tank. Yeah. So, so fake. The reason I, I think this is weird is because I have been to the tank. Yeah. I have been to the actual tank that NASA has yeah, where it has the mock-up, the neutral buoyancy, simulator. the neutral buoyancy laboratory, the sunny, sunny Carson neutral buoyancy lab. I'm going to have to, I hope I didn't get that wrong. And did you read his plaque at the door, by the way? No, I did not. This no. guy, he was an, a, an MD, a physicist, a brain surgeon, uh, you know, practically a god. I mean, you read this guy's resume, just walking to the door, you feel like you're about an inch tall. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's and, and, and so 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 I, I've been there and I've seen what the what the mock up looks like, what it would take to put mm -hmm. a life size space station in a tank. I mean, the, 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 the swimming pool is enormous, but it cannot fit the entirety of 
the space station. Keep in mind, well, this is it's okay. But wait a minute, you don't see the entirety of the space station. The shots you just see one unit at a time, one well, module at well, a time. Well, well, in the the space station construction, you saw the they would go all the way to the top of it and look down, and you would see everything. Also, the Earth. Well, but but that was a model. We're talking about the stuff inside <laughs> in spacewalks. The right, thing that well, confused me is also having been to the neutral buoyancy lab. Um, they're bubbles. Yeah. When people yeah, breathe, especially with no breathing apparatus, trying to hang upside down underwater for, this, for half does, hour photography. Does this theory explain how the astronauts breathe in the water in the tank? Is it oh, that like hills? We know that. Is it, is it that that stuff from the abyss from that, that, no, they have that movie, the abyss with gills on their neck. You just can't see them because <laughs> oh they're aliens. I'm sorry. So I'm now now we have mutant here. astronauts. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, and gosh, you know, once again, we've only gotten through a handful of stories. We still have. Well, actually, we can fit this one in. OK, because this is one you do frequently, I think, at space.com. Big Mars. Big, big Mars. Oh, it's going to be as every, big as the full moon tomorrow. You know, this is a very appropriate time to talk about Big Mars because it comes around every September. So mm. <laughs> this is this is when. Um, yeah, this is a real fun one. And we, we've written about it on space.com quite a lot, usually around this time of year, because um, around late August, early September is when the Mars as big as the moon hoax comes up and it tells it tells everyone that uh, that, hey, tonight, you know, look up. Mars is going to be as big as the moon. It's going to mess up all of our gravity and things are going to float and it's cows will fly. Amazing. And the really interesting thing is that it has roots in a very singular thing that did, in fact, happen back in the early 2000s, I think in 2003, when Mars actually made its historic closest approach to Earth. And, you know, for like 60,000 years or something, it wasn't going to be instead any Instead of being a tiny red dot, it was a slightly less tiny red slightly, dot. Slightly less, slightly brighter, just like a super moon. By the way, there's another one on August 31st, and it's a uh -huh. blue moon. And uh, and again, the, the moon's going to, it's the biggest full moon of the year. And uh, I guarantee you, it will not look as much bigger to you <laughs> than, than yes. the last uh, super moon or, or full moon looked. But that's where it came from. And this email like circled it around and went viral at a time when I guess emails could go viral because everyone had chain emails back then. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it just keeps coming back over and over again that it's going to be as big as the full moon in the, in the night sky. And it just, it's just, it's not the case at all uh so if you ever see that or that it's going to look green that's another one too is that it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll turn the moon green uh too and someone made a v image of that with mars and like a green moon um and so Wait, just green just, moon or green mars no like like the, the the moon the moon turns green and 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 mars is giant and uh -huh. anyway just it, it's it's one of those things that went viral because someone like sent the note by the way that's how we got the term supermoon back in the early 2010s or 2002 uh -huh. is that a a what is that an astrologist uh Astrology. sent around uh e emails you know saying that the, it was the biggest full moon and they they phrased it as that that went viral and now nasa has embraced it as a way to get people to look at the moon during it's at perigee it's diluted what a super moon is supposed to be which is the biggest singular full moon of the entire year mm. uh now it's whenever the moon is at perigee which is its closest point uh, to the earth during its, its month long orbit. And, and we're talking uh, a difference of like 30, 33,000 miles, something like that. Yeah. 14%, 14% brighter, brighter, just like a sliver, uh, of, 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 uh, of what it looks like because it's hundreds of thousands of miles out there. So. Ant looks like he's doubting our logic. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on. I wanted to pop in and say, thank you, Mr. Tarek for mentioning this because I've been here in super moon for the last handful of years. And every time I yeah. go outside, it never really does anything for it me. Doesn't. And I'm like, what, <laughs> what is, what is so daggum super about the moon? It's full. It, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> you know, and if it's, yeah, the, that, that's the thing is it did originate by the, by, you know, it was a, it was a, actually, no, I think it was a book. It was a book by a, an astrologist that, that would, you know, astrologer, very, astrologer, astrolog, yeah. astronomist. Yeah. We're not going to call them that. <laughs> um, and and it, it just said, yeah, it's going to be the biggest full moon of the year. And and this is going to happen. And like your, I don't know, your chakra is in Libra. <laughs> Who knows right. what? I don't know. I would have all of the photographers messaging me about the moon coming up. And 
and people talking about putting their stones outside and this and that. And I'm like, I guess we should do this every month because every month there's a super moon. Come on, every every Come month there's a full moon. Well, this this summer, I'll point it out. We're, we're, this summer there are four perigee moons, so that there are four full moons during perigee when the moon is at its closest to the Earth, which according which NASA now has called a super moon. You know, they have adopted the term for a perigee moon, not the singular biggest full moon of the year, which is what the August 2023 full moon is. It's the biggest of the entire uh, year. And um, and that's where that comes from. You know, it, it started out as like this kind of really kind of spiritual thing. Um, it did go viral. I admit that at space.com, we do play into that because it gets people excited to look at the moon. No. And I get I get flack about doing that every time that I'll there bet. is one coming up. And in fact, I think that... Um, I think that, uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, at the, the Neil we'll deGrasse Tyson, when you remember. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson has actually called us out. I think I might've mentioned this a few no. times in his stage show, um, what? about how to see the moon. Yeah. Well, cause we, we celebrate it and it's just silly. You can't tell the difference, you know, yeah. to your eye, the moon looks the same and he's right. He's right. But it's fun. It's fun to discuss and use it as a way to get people to look up at the moon because, um, um, the moon is the easiest astronomical object uh, aside from uh, the sun and maybe Venus uh, that people can observe. Uh, and it's one of the safest because you don't burn your eyeballs out, Rod, uh, looking at the uh, the moon. Why do you uh, say that? Why do you address me? <laughs> Just because I got cataracts when I was 50 from staring at the sun like a dog. <laughs> okay, I got two closing points here. It is worth mentioning that the distance between the Earth and Mars ranges from about... 250 million miles to what I think it's 33 million. Yeah. But regardless, it's still just a speck. And if you've ever looked at it when it's at the furthest point away from us through a telescope, it's really small. And when you look at it, when it's closer, it's a little bigger and you can see some, some fuzzy surface features, but with the naked eye, it's still just a brighter red dot. Um, and I also did a thing recently on, on WGN radio. I do that every month and they're a lot of fun. We went through all the names of the weird moons, like super, super blood worm moon. You know? <laughs> I mean, and the origin of this is back in, well, at least the origin on, in the West is in Europe in the olden days. They named the full moon of each month after something different, which usually had to do with agriculture, you know, harvest mm -hmm. or hunting, moon, yeah, flower yeah. moon, things like that, or hunting, yeah. So it, it's not a big mystery, me. but it, it, as you say, it is a great clickbait headline. Not that you'd ever do that. And um, yeah, that's all it is. You know, we, we still have a bunch of these left. So I fear <laughs> we're going to have to have conspiracies three, unless we get a lot of angry emails saying, please stop that. Uh, <laughs> do you have anything else, my friend? No, I would just say, you know, uh, the, the, the super moon in particular is just a fun one. Uh, but Ant is right. I was actually, I went, I went to an event to, to go watch it rise uh, up from the horizon uh, and it was all foggy. And so no one could see anything. And the photographers next to me said, super moon, more like super bust. And this is the year that, that it was actually going viral at that time. But I would just say that if you ever want to see something that's really, really strange and easy to measure with the I'm moon, looking at him right now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go out right when the moon is rising. Take a look because the moon will look really, really big to you and uh, put your thumb up and, and see how large your thumb is next to that moon. And then go up later on in the night when the moon is really high in the sky and when it looks really tiny and put your thumb up again. And it will actually be the same size as it was when you went out when it looked a lot bigger. And it's just a really, really strange aspect uh, of the moon's like just how it rises because of how we see it with our well, and process it with our eyes. It's the right, moon illusion, perception. not a conspiracy. Yeah. It's a perception illusion. And it's just one of the weirdest and, and wildest things uh, to appreciate when the moon, you know, uh, rises because man, it can look beautiful and ginormous coming over the hills of New Jersey <laughs> here, you know, red and, and an orange kind of with all that filtering and the, uh, the, the dust in the atmosphere. And just knowing that when it looks that giant and then when it's right overhead and looking tiny, it's the same size. You know, I can measure it with my thumb or with a ruler. You can even use a ruler uh, to measure it. It's the same. And it's just so hard to like wrap your head around. Not a conspiracy. I don't know how I got there. I'm sorry. I love the moon. You got so. there because your left <laughs> thumb is the size of a dime and your right thumb is the size of a half dollar. <laughs> you guys some pretty crazy answers.
educate me one of these days on the moon and, and its phases and all of that, because here me going outside to try to get photography of the full moon is a whole different experience for when I was in Carolina, mm. you know, right, uh -huh. right now, if I want to get a good moon shot, I have to do it pretty much like, uh, 8 PM or something like that, because if yeah. I wait until it's really dark, it's so much further away and really, really hard to see, but I'm sure you all understand the science behind all of that. I ha don't, ha but that's, having, that's what having, for, I hope. Yeah, having having objects in the foreground to really give perspective to what the moon looks like really helps a lot. Well, you know, that would be another interesting test to photograph the moon with a telephoto on the horizon during a harvest moon when it looks big, and then photographing it when it's directly overhead at the zenith with that same telephoto with a fixed focal length and see if it changes di visual diameter. Someone do that. Someone that's listening, do that. Ant, well, we got that. Ant right here. <laughs> And thank God the moon is something you can actually see and photograph uh, with all the light pollution we have. Well, this has been too much fun. And <laughs> I do want to do it again because I really enjoy these things, even though it may come off as a little snarky. It's fun. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today for another discussion of our favorite space conspiracies. Tarek, where do you hide the truth these days? Well, I mean, you can always find me at space.com and uh, I am still on, I guess I'm on X now, still <laughs> at uh, Tarek, Tarek J. Malik, which you can find me writing about all the fun space stuff. And uh, this weekend I'll be picking up my daughter from her first week away uh, summer camp and finding out all of the fun adventures that she got up to uh, while, uh, uh, while we were working and toiling away on this episode. Well, cool. And this weekend, I'll be down in Long Beach tending to my boat with 72 mile an hour estimated wind speeds from our first hurricane. Hurricane which, Hillary. Watch yeah, out. Yeah, could be very exciting. We'll see. Uh, if I don't show up next week, you'll know why. And you can always find me either under 10 fathoms of water or at pilebooks.com and at astromagazine.com. Please don't forget to drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. We answer every single email. You can do so at twist at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas, and jokes. And uh, when you want credit for your joke, I'll give it to you on the air, unlike <laughs> the one we had this week. Uh, but I understand why he did that. Um, also, don't forget to check out space.com. Website's in the name, and you'll see lots of interesting headlines there. And the National Space Society at nss.org. I don't know if I places. like the way you laughed there, Rod. To satisfy <laughs> your spaceflight cravings. Because, I, and by the way, we should point out that our headlines today were from space.com. I think we neglected to do that. I said it. I said it. Did you? Yeah. Well, that just shows you my my brain is made of the same stuff the moon is with cheese. New episodes publish every Friday in your favorite podcatcher, so be sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. We'll take whatever you got. You can also head to our website at twit.tv slash twists. And don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit as well as some extras only found there for just $7 a month. And you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on X and on Facebook, <laughs> twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you very much, everybody. And we will see you next week. It's midweek and you really want to know even more about the world of technology. So you should check out Tech News Weekly, the show where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. It's the biggest news. We talk with the uh, people writing the stories that you're probably reading. We also talk between ourselves about the stories that are getting us even more excited about tech news this week. So if you're excited, well, then join us. Head to twit.tv slash TNW to subscribe. <laughs>